Peter Evans is known as one of the top, I mean, world-leading trumpet players. And I know trumpet might, to some of you, seem an odd instrument, but when it's in Peter's mouth, the control he has is not only intoxicating, it's kind of transcendent. He studied in the jazz department of the New England Conservatory of Music School Preparatory Education and graduated from the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. He came to New York in 2003 and started working with a variety of people, including Tyshawn Sorry, Peter Bratzman, Weasel Walter, Tim Dahl, George Lewis, Anthony Braxton. I would describe his playing as something that's just... Let me put it this way. The first time I saw Peter Evans play, I'm like, if he can hold his breath and make that kind of sound with a trumpet, I was a little bit interested in what he, what else he could do with his mouth, but that's just me going off. I mean, let's get back to Peter for a minute, please. He said that, I mean, his performances are both seductive and confrontational, and he said that the confrontational energy that he puts into it really speaks about this emotional center, which he sees as just simply rooted in the human expression. And I'm quoting him when he says, the best possible feeling is like a flow state. I'm just making sure the fire stays on, and I'm watching the whole thing happen and making sure everyone's cool. For some reason, I get hot when I hear Peter Evans now. That's just the way I feel, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Evans. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. We are in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, home of uh, ungentrified Polish hovels and a couple of hipsters that haven't yet quite gotten the money to move to Williamsburg. We are talking tonight with Peter Evans, a uh, incredible musician who has the ability to hold his breath and blow at the same time like no one you've ever heard. <laughs> I kind of uh, envy that talent, Peter. Well, come on, Peter. <laughs> no, P- Peter, who I've actually worked with, is a is a uh, trumpet virtuoso. If you don't know who he is, we're lucky to have him here tonight. So, Peter, hold my breath and blow it at the same time. Oh, oh yeah, I never <laughs> thought of it like that. <laughs> but it, I got to put that, that in my bio. That's going on the on the next blurb. You can quote me, but isn't that kind of what you do? Well, circular breathing. Yeah. They don't call circular that breathing. in the Excuse other. Cr- being a non-muso, yeah, that's a little technical. Being a non-muso, it is called circular <laughs> breathing. Sure. In other words, holding, holding and blowing, and sucking at the same time. Right? Wait a minute. All right, we we on, went from wait. holding and blowing to holding and sucking. Uh, holding. That's, sucking a, that's means- a dirty trick. Sucking means something different in music. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> blowing and holding, or holding and blowing. What is it? What exactly is it that you? That is your speciality, Peter, because it is a unique talent that is actually it gets girls pretty excited because they're like, "How does he do that? And what does he do afterwards?" It's the circular breathing. It's sure, yeah. it's sure, it's not the double and triple tonguing. Exactly. Well, come on, I'm a man that. of many talents here. Well, no doubt. I, I want you to <laughs> extrapolate on that. You want me to get technical or what? Uh, tech, I like it. Tech, I like precision. Yeah. So you know, it's like. Uh, I mean, it's it's radio. Is this radio? Can I call it radio? No. 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 Pod, what is this? The Lydian spin. I'm. I'm, so I'm you're in I'm, the Lydian spin, I'm, honey. You can I'm do whatever. I'm patting you want. my head and rubbing my stomach at the same time. Is that time. what you do with your mouth? That's what I. That's yeah. That's my whole vibe. Can you please is, explain really what it is you do, and and we will send people to horribly beautiful things that you've produced in the past after this podcast. Uh, How did you re- develop this technique? It's called circular breathing. Yeah, it's just like a, a tool. It's like I, you know, I have a bunch of different tools, and that's one of them. And um, I just, I heard, I needed to use it to make a certain type of music, and so then uh, I learned how to do it, and then that's just part of the whole toolkit at this point. Is it kind of I don't a think about it that much. Version of throat singing in a kind of weird way. I don't know. No, yeah. it's like it's like uh, you. Uh, you you force air out of your cheeks while breathing in through your nose at the same time. Unbelievable. So you just decouple two things that normally go together. So you understand why women are often excited about <laughs> your potential talents after the gig. Like, what else does he do with that? Right. Mouth. Yeah. Well, so so you you don't you don't think about it that much. 
now, I know when I give like bass lessons, there's all this stuff like, I don't think about it now, but then I'm like, oh yeah, at one point in my life, I had to think about this Yeah, you think about it, and, yeah. And so what I'm getting at, you know, and I, this is my cliche about brass players in particular, certain instruments, it's kind of like the actual technique is so important just to even get a fucking sound out of that. Well, when I thing. watch somebody play a trumpet, I can't even fucking, I've been doing it for 30 years. When I watch somebody else play it even halfway decently, I can't even believe it. I'm like transfixed. I don't even like the trumpet that much. But when I watch somebody do it, I'm like, all these elements are going together. Why specifically the trumpet? Because that's your instrument? Or, I mean, yeah, because I do it all the time. So I'm, I mean, I love watching anybody so play an why instrument. 30 years ago, did the young Peter Evans, how old were you then, decide Seven. to pick up the trumpet? A seven-year-old trumpet player? Because I was into um, shredding 80s guitar, and when I wanted to play guitar, my parents said no. Oh, because that's this true? Is, yeah, because this is when like, MTV and shit was Whoa. like coming into the household, and my mom was like, I don't know, it looks like an instrument for hoodlums. So, uh, so, then, I, so then I was like, well, I don't know, the next, the next thing on the album, there was like, my parents were the types of people to whom jazz was marketed in the 80s. And they okay. they actually went and saw shit. So they saw they saw Miles play like in a snakeskin Incredible. cape, and they saw Dexter Gordon and Earl Hines and all those people. So that that's kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, think most did they are, like it? They liked. They loved it. Yeah, okay. They no, loved that, it. That's actually pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. And so because neither of them but had at really, seven. Do you give a shit? They had they had Miles Davis's first post retirement album, Man with a Horn. Man with a Horn. Yeah. And the first thing on it is this shredding guitar solo. That sounds like Van Halen, basically. It's this other Mike Stern. Mike Stern. It's it's less. It's not as cool as Van Halen, but still. So I was like, oh, that's cool. And my that's sister for played. Those of you who think Van Halen is cool, yeah. Which, well, by the way, I'm just gonna interject because I didn't even know this was a Van Halen song, but Sylvia Black and I just covered. Ain't talking about. Oh, that's love. of course. Mm. By Van One Halen. Of the best In rock. a way you've never heard it before. Carry on now, Van Halen. <laughs> One of the best oh, riffs of all times. But okay. By the way, you know the story. David Lee Roth did try to pick me up once, but oh god, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't succeed. Clearly, uh, obviously. <laughs> Carry on, Peter. So now, mom so and dad I, are going to see Dexter Gordon. They're seeing all the shit, and so then there was some records around the house, and it was rubbing off on me. And there was this um, alcoholic retired band director that lived on our kind of cul-de-sac who could- Where quote, was that? Where's the cul-de-sac? Connecticut, in Connecticut. So he, he could quote unquote teach any instrument. And so my sister was playing violin and, and that so- That must have been a nightmare. Yeah, so, so she's playing the violin. I was, I, was, I was into listening to her practice. So they were like, would you want to play something? Stay out of trouble. And so they were like, why don't you go study with Mr. Jones and play trumpet? And uh, it's one of those guys, he was, a, he was a good guy, but I one of my distinct memories of- just about awareness was when we moved from Connecticut to Massachusetts, I was playing in the, in the elementary school band and it was like my last concert and Mr. Jones was going to come. I was like probably playing for two years at that point. He's, just like, going. he's like, he's like, check this out. Exactly. So it's my last day of, yeah, of school. Mr. Jones. Yeah, exactly. Mr. Jones, so my last Mr. Jones, day of school, Jones, this band on. concert. I hope you and didn't have a thing going on. I'm sitting in the auditorium waiting to play. And my like whatever sex, third grade teacher sitting next to me, and, and Mr. Jones comes in alone, uh, off the street, and he he walks in and he looks at me. And he's like, "Hey, Peter," and he goes and gets a seat. And my teacher looks at me with this worried look and goes, "Who is that man?" <laughs> <laughs> and so and I, in my, I don't know what pedophilia was, but at nine, at Mr. nine, Jones, I knew Mr. Jones, my Mr. teacher Jones. thinks Mr. Jones is a bad man, and I don't I know why. And now I, now, but now I put it together over the years. Wow. <laughs> Whoa! Can I? Um, I'm just gonna. Have go- you taught all the instruments. I, what, do you also teach the sack pot, <laughs> <laughs> aka the trombone? Anyhow, but all his right. his house was full. It was like some old. It was really old people shit. Like individually wrapped candies in a big jar, and like oh, lots yeah. of like like. Did he have, did he, <laughs> did he have, did he have really bad creepy. breath? He had bad breath and a I big purple did. nose. Of course, he had bad breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> they yeah. Always do. So or yeah, he's he's alcoholic. So, he was so a good guy though. Good so teacher. What was interesting about that because you know I was. And, you know, forgive me, I always just thought, you know, especially with uh, public education and just the where music education went yeah. uh, from the 60s to the 70s, which is basically yeah. the transformation, which is subsidies based on with Yamaha and all these companies. Yeah. No more violins. Yeah. It's only going to be brass. It's only going to be reeds because it's, it's yeah. easier for kids to uh, Cheaper play. instruments. And, and, and I always, my experience in public school is basically like, I was social, but a lot of the kids that were in band were basically yeah. like, the band director would be like, oh, this kid's like quiet into themselves. Give them I, a, an Here's instrument. an instrument, yeah, so right. here's an excuse for you to no, I didn't have tap that. out of society and practice all the time. But So just it, as a non-musician <laughs> who used a musical instrument as a torture device, you, <laughs> you pick can. up the trumpet. You pick up the trumpet. Yeah. You start to blow. Yeah. Nothing comes out. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you go, yeah, I'm going to do this? I mean, that's... 
to me, like anything like mouth instruments, even mm-hmm. even the Jews harp, even the Cone Tip Wax, <laughs> it's far more difficult to try to manipulate a sound out of. And to do then have not only that, but learn how to play, then develop your own sound than something like a guitar, which I consider, you know, like every asshole. A little has generic. A guitar, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every asshole has a guitar. Yeah. I well, think yeah, right. I, 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 I started it, I had a knack for it, and then you just it was, knew. and I was, I was interested, I liked being alone and practicing and just kind of not having to deal with anybody. So after, after you pick up the, the trumpet for the first time, how soon after that do you think, okay, I'm going to do this? Like, s- quick? Uh, when I was like 12, at which point I've been playing for maybe four or five years, just I remember having cool. a thought of like, this is the shit, because I was already checking out music. Like away from what my parents, you know, parents were into. So, so they were already into cool shit. So what were you? They checking were kind out of into twelve. Cool. Uh, what are you checking out then? I don't. Even, I somehow I got my hands on stuff. Like I remember a friend of mine gave me a trout mask replica. <laughs> and I was like, "This is I this have the most." To say that album is so annoying to me for this reason. It's annoying Every music. No wave band has been compared to fucking Captain Beefheart. I've got yeah. nothing to do with Captain Beefheart ever, oh, okay. except for. A drummer I once played with in my band, 30, 30, Cliff Martins, yeah. went on to play with him. Yeah. But, you know, that was like, Trout Rap Mask Rap, who's like, Al No Wave, no, I never listened to that shit, and I didn't like it, but go ahead. I liked it. It impacted it was, you. It was garbagey and crowded, and yeah. it made everyone, whenever I played it to somebody, it made them it's mad. It's maniacal. <laughs> it, made, it made people mad. Yeah. And it's I irritating. Just, and I it, like it. Yeah, and I, I, it irritated me, but I just kept going back for more. It irritated okay. you so it got right my, it, went, it went my appetite for, for a complex, like, saturated shit. Which so I, that that album pretty much started you at twelve on your yeah path. basically. But I would also assume you're learning standard repertoire. Yeah, I was going to like so, so you're you're playing classical music and you're playing I was, jazz. Oh yeah, I was, I was in a so classical it must music have too. A, must have a big influence on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was playing classical music. I, I played in a. Uh, I was lucky enough to play in a, in a, a youth orchestra. Right. There. Which was yeah. <laughs> Look, come on, Lydia. This is who you invited to be on this show, all right? To play you with can't, you're not going to band camp no, shame I, me I wish, on your, on your wish, fucking podcast. I'm just saying, I I'm wish I could have played with a youth orchestra. <laughs> Look, so you I played, played in them. I wanted to play with them. So it was, it was, it was conducted. He's this guy still around. He's a. You don't want to play in them, Lydia? He, no. <laughs> you wanna, <laughs> yeah, a lot of fresh, fresh meat. I mean, I still think that. I'd like to play with Peter Evans, but we're not going to go there right now. <laughs> That 19th century uh, hysterical romantic music sounds best when it's played by like hormonally crazed children, you know. So I was pl- I was I was in an orchestra. <laughs> we're, such a funny we're playing point. like we're playing like Mahler and and, yeah, exactly. and Rachmaninoff and shit like that. And I was I mean it's all about being refined. And you guys are no un- everyone's you want you you want to yeah, right, exactly. bang the cello player. I mean everything's insane. You're like you're 13. It's like so crazy. So so basically that was that was my introduction to like classical music. So I would sit in this orchestra. It was conducted by this guy that's still around who was uh, very conniving, smart. He's a kind of a Leonard Bernstein type who also got into the '90s like kind of corporate talk vibe, like motivational. Spe- <laughs> oh, yeah, so he was doing. So he was basically like a total <laughs> creep. <laughs> <laughs> who is this? This guy ben, Benjamin Zander. He's still, still around. He's this English guy. I actually think he's not. He's probably not even British. He's probably faking the whole thing. <laughs> but he's fucking hilarious. It's beneficial to this, you. Oh, somehow. this this guy was basically he'd stand in front of the orchestra and tell us that when he was conducting Beethoven, he actually literally he was was the Catholic. He was trans. Mogrify, whatever turned he actually was Beethoven. Into was he yes. dead? Was he deaf at that point? No, he was. He was. He was a. <laughs> was he dead? No, he was. He was on drugs. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing, and the thing they want to tell you about Beethoven is didn't bathe. Uh, yeah, he was advocate on the floor of his sure. house all the time. Like the, the secret. Peeping, Rock and roll. Got, got arrested yeah. for peeping, being a peeping tom. And yeah, I, mean, I love most it. Most musicians have, you know, a rather sorted history. I mean, they, yeah. yeah, and it didn't begin with rock and roll. That's yeah. I mean, I, I've been doing a bunch. Went way back. I've been thrown into some. Uh, well, I've, uh, that's, that's that's a passive way of saying it. I've taken some teaching gigs over the last few years. Oh, Not a job. I don't have a job, but I've done some like well, workshops, occasional tell. things. Yeah, yeah. I think workshops are a very important thing to do because, especially when you have a unique manner. Of application mm. to a, not a traditional art, but to any art yeah, yeah. that to inspire other people to just be weirder and better and more themselves. I mean, I do workshops. I'm going to do a series of workshops in a few days. I think Where? it's very important in Scandinavia. Mm. I think it's very important. Mine is how do, how do you so you write? How do you perform it? So your workshops are what are they? Well, They're I'm amazing. I'm I'm the I'm uh, the uncle that ha- that comes in and can say. <laughs> Santa Claus doesn't exist. <laughs> Here's a cigarette. Bye. See you next Christmas. Whereas the people that have the jobs, you can't say shit like that because you, you're you have, you're accountable. So my role and the people the people that invite me to do these things kind of 
know that I'm the uncle and I can come in and just tell the truth uncle and Larry. leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, creepy Uncle Peter. Uncle <laughs> yeah, with a special you. juice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so okay, but wait, what exactly are you doing in these workshops? <laughs> I I understand the concept. So, what do you go in there and do? I can well, make them cry. <laughs> I've made some, I've made them cry a little how bit. How old are the How old are the students? They're generally college age, but I've had some okay, younger infants, ones or older words. ones. What's what's that? Infants, in other words. Well, that's the whole problem. Is that like you, that what made me think of this? Is the thing about you know musicians are just a sordid bunch of people, which I like. It's right. fun. I but mean, not the fact millennials. The fact the fact that Jizwaldo killed his wife makes him more interesting, not less interesting. You know, it's not that good that he did it, but so it, so anyway, I was at a, doing a thing a couple years ago, and I saw this student ask. You know, to, the, to a whole bunch of faculty, this roundtable thing, like, you know, what do you do when um, you f- you find out that somebody you looked up to did something, you know, terrible? How do you? Uh, millennial. Uh, yeah, and uh, made me think of there's this, you know, this guy uh, Rizard Kapuscinski. I'm probably not saying his name right. This Polish journalist. His whole vibe was he would go to places where revolution was about to break out, and he would just plant himself there for like a year or two. So he did, he wrote a book about, um, you know, called the Shah of Shahs about Iran. He went to Ethiopia when all was going down. He went all over the place. And he was from Poland, grew up during the war, and he spent Which his, war? One or two. World War II. Spent his whole life traveling around the Soviet Union, and then finally wrote this book called Imperium, which is about Imperium. In, about the Soviet Union and what it was and what it, and how it was breaking apart. And he he goes to uh, the Caucasus, and he's in, uh, um, I think it's Uzbekistan. Could be. And there's a there was this guy there, T- uh, Timur Tamerlane, who was like kind of a Genghis Khan type figure, like a despot, really super powerful, charismatic guy. And he was really into poetry and music and architecture. And he built all this amazing shit. And there's a city there that he basically supervised the building of that's that's still there. And it's beautiful. This guy would also, he was like some, you know, general butt naked Liberian warlord kind of vibe. Like he, this guy would wake up and just like make sure that he was there for when people got tortured and killed and like drink their blood and stuff. And this guy was a <laughs> maniac. And so basically like you would, people would hear, people would hear stories about this guy and just flee into, you hear his name and you just start like screaming in terror. So Kapuscinski has this great thing about there. So some, some English historian nerd wrote a biography of Tamerlane that's like, well, how could this guy that was super into poetry and music and architecture and culture be such a monster? And Kapuscinski's like, you idiot. It's because he was a monster that exactly. he was able to explore these things on this extreme level, as ugly as that might be. This guy, was, exactly. this guy was opening the pair of scissors to a point that most people are, don't even open them. But this guy is like, <laughs> Tam- Tamerlane is opening the shit all the, all the fucking way. And it's, it's very disturbing to think that that is kind of what we're all doing on some level. You're listening to The Lydian Spin with Tim Dahl, our special Tamerlane. guest is <laughs> Call <Evans>. in. <laughs> and we're discussing all things Timor. high and low, and it's true. Yeah. I mean, the thing is... We- Samarkand is the name of the city, Samarkand. With artists, with musicians, with writers, with directors, with anybody that has a need to create that boils their blood, and if they don't do it, they will become violent, and some of us are violent anyway, because no amount of art is going to be like cauterize the original wound, which goes back well be- beyond our bloodline, our <laughs> physicality, and perhaps even the DNA we can or cannot decode. That, you know, we look for catharsis. Does it exist? I really don't think it It doesn't. Uh, you know, art catharsis, more so for the people that come to it. And I don't consider the people that come to my show an audience. I consider them a bizarre group of individuals who for some reason decided to leave the house. Who, <laughs> who, have, who have a need for something that they think I can provide them with. And it's always different. And whatever that is. I hope <laughs> that it solves some part of their universal wound. Yeah. So yes, we are all monsters. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Peter Evans, and here we go again. But then here you are in late 20th century hey, United, wait a United, United States, yep. and, and basically it's like, okay, you also have to compartmentalize. Like, okay, yep. I have a family that loves me. They're yep. providing for me. Sure. I'm doing this thing, and of course, where you are now and your perspective of these things is is after a, a whole a few decades of experience yep. and all that stuff. So then, so you, you, you go through the system. You you, yep. you, go, you go to college. I, I don't know if you have a scholarship, but, but you're good enough to get into a conservatory. Oberlin, yeah. And, and, you're, and you're playing. You do the whole thing, and then, of course, you, you go through the filter of a conservatory and the teachers, yep. and, and you and you find there's hierarchy, and, and particularly with brass, like, that's like a really yeah. particularly vibey hierarchy. Totally. And of course, I, at least I would assume you reach a technical ambition just to kind of get yourself out of certain elements of mm-hmm. your big quote unquote break. Was, was, it, was that uh, Evan Parker? Like, what brought you to the international stage more than yeah, anything else? Yeah, I, I would say Evan. Evan Parker? Yeah, basically, like, yeah, I went, I did, did the musical thing. I kind of was, uh, was good enough in school that people sort of left me alone. 
So okay. I, people didn't like what I did. My teachers, huh. people, you know, looking back on some of the shit, it's like, I don't say I hold grudges, but I definitely remember yeah. with a certain, I know exactly what you a mean. certain pointed, like, I remember who told me at what point, like, hey man, your shit sucks or you're never going to be able to do well, this well, or yeah, whatever. I mean, some, of the, some of the people have dedicated to academia, not all, but some of them I feel like are a little bummed out that they're, they're they, out. they know that other these students are going to go hit the the world. Uh, all right, let, let's just let me just cut in as a non-muser for a minute. Yeah. You at 7 had a vision, you kept up with it, you went to Oberlin College. You're now superseding or surpassing with all the musical knowledge that you've already gathered, but you still know you're a fucking weirdo. Yeah. And you know that the music you want to do is going to be something outside the mainstream, Captain Beefheart or not. Hope dedicated. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you decide with all of the knowledge and with all of the experience that you already have as just somebody coming out of the gate that you want to make something that to most people is going to be unlistenable. Welcome to the, f- the club, my friend. You want it, You were making something that was, it's not no wave. I want to ask you mm. what the genre is you mm. think that you occupy. And this is to somebody that, that doesn't really know, mm. that, that doesn't know classical or doesn't know jazz music, yeah. but that might come to your show and go, because, I mean, I brought people to your show that had no idea about any kind of out jazz, jazz yeah, in yeah, general, yeah. even no wave, mm. and they were blown away. Not just say that they might have liked it or sure. didn't like yeah, it, yeah. but they were fascinated by this unique nature of what you do. So do you have a genre? I mean, I don't like genres either, but yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. I, I still consider myself no wave no matter what format it takes. Yeah. I don't think of it like that, but I guess it's trying to step outside of myself a little bit. It's like I have to cut people a break. It's like the kind of uh, the, the shit that went into this sort of stew that made what I made the music makes the music that I make I guess comes out of like black American jazz and European modernism I guess it's like those two things and then but I take shit from all over the place too so I don't really I'm constantly well, listening to shit that's take, what's weird about you Peter Evans is that there's all kinds of out jazz out post jazz mm, I don't give it, no way yeah. in New York but you kind of occupy this other terrain I can't figure it out either I know when I see it it's it's kind of stupendous, but I don't even, I don't know what to call it either. I can't define it, which was good. I mean, I don't like definitions either. And it's just something that you have to actually see to experience. I don't think even the records, even the recordings, I mean, you can hear it, but to see it is because it's more of a phenomena. But I, th- I think with Peter, and I, I worked with Peter and I've known him for a little while. I think there's also part of, uh, if I may, part of Peter's art is personal curiosity and, and exploration is also a part of it. Basically, what I want to do and what I want to explore, I'm going to do it. Hmm. And 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 fortunately, you have the um, the thing that the, I mentioned the ability, here. and also you actually have the infrastructure. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Infrastructure. But I'm yeah. That's another. That's a different conversation way. But the thing the thing that I like in art is like uh, this idea that. Uh, human beings are basically gods. We're like gods. So we can create, like I was reading this thing about how people did, like technology people are are talking about this idea that you were storing, you can store data. Data storage is now like this lucrative thing. We can store data in DNA. I'm not sure exactly how this would work. I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. So this idea that like you can basically take, take, um, abstract objects and put them together to make these morphing universes out of sound and these kind of objects and sound is not really uh, that's not something that's relegated to a particular genre like you can hear that in all kinds of music I know whether it's timbres or what, notes what, or rhythms or whatever when so. you're performing what, what is the point so you're performing sometimes in front of an audience of 10 to a thousand people hmm I mean, is the point that... Five to a thousand. Two to a thousand. <laughs> two, two, to two, two to ten thousand. Two to ten thousand. Zero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, zero. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, no, my... Quick, <laughs> a quick aside, my only gig playing for zero people was for not some inward turning modernist experiment, but it was for a technical funk band called Groove Assault. <laughs> I hope you got paid. In the early two thousands. I hope you got paid. Okay. What was kind of crushing to me... It's kind of... It's kind of crushing to me about... A lot of musicians on the New York scene now, which I consider, and just as a generic term, like the out jazz. I mean, sure. that's, that's yeah, insulting yeah. to me, but scene is that so many incredible people play for so few people yeah. because New York just doesn't give a shit or yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm like, well, if, they, if nobody's coming, why the fuck are you playing? I don't think. Like, why do you wait to go to Europe where they do respect you? I mean, do you, do you have to play out? Here, wait. In general, in, no, you're in asking New York, me. In New York, oh, I, I don't. I've seen great concerts, many of them, where there's like two, five, ten people. Yeah, that, that's that's a thing. I don't. That's a, that's a thing. I, I don't. I don't think. I don't take the New York like reality of like 
gigs that really that well, seriously. It's, it's it is what it is. It's universe. a little. It's not the center of the. It's universe. just a little thing that happens. I mean, I, I but came. Why do you still? You know that you're going to play some places that there's going to be nobody at, but you still do the gigs. Mm-hmm. Uh, wouldn't you say that's chops? I mean, gig shops are different than practice shops. Wouldn't you say so? Hold on a second. The, why do you do co- gigs if you know nobody's going to be there? Yeah. Um, New York is like a is a laboratory place. It's not like a. I came to New York without knowing pretty much anything about how anything Wait, worked. What year was that? 2003. But I did have some idea just from like reading about shit that like, hmm, this is probably the place if you want to go to other places, you got to be here to do that. And it kind of works. We're going back to Tim's initial question about what were the big breaks and blah, blah, blah. That actually is sort of is how, it, I mean, it happened, it quote unquote happened for me in, in a sort of textbook way. Like I came here. I was a little bit stubborn about uh, what I wanted to do. So, like, I even though I had like a pretty good conventional musical training, I decided not to go down that road. And I just worked regular day jobs and then did my own thing at night. So I we- totally weird shit. I already ha- I had something kind of ready to go. Trumpet or double trumpet. Sure. Circular yeah. brain. So I started doing little gigs. Started meeting people. A lot of the shit didn't work out. I met some freaks that I couldn't relate to. Uh, I met some musicians that I still play with, worked weird jobs, and then after a few years, I started f- like freelancing in the cl- kind of the classical scene a little bit because I just wanted to make some money playing trumpet and not work at Tower Records or whatever. Give me a break. So then right around that time, because I had been doing my own thing for a few years, um, I met some musicians. I met Evan Parker when he was playing a show at Tonic, and I was a fan, and like his shit influenced my concept a lot. Um, the kind of morphing kind of DNA strand thing. So he invited me over. He was staying in some shitty apartment somewhere, and he was like, want to come over and just... I mean, it was very generous of him. Marcus Stockhausen kind of put us in touch because I met Marcus at, at a music seminar thing. So I go over, and he was like, all right, well, what's your deal, kid? So I basically told him, and he's like, do you have any music? And I, I, I gave him some music. Never, so what do you mean you gave him some cheap music? You gave him some sheet music? I gave him like a recording. recording music, okay. yeah. 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 And then we stayed in touch, and then I... Sent. I made a little solo recording a f- couple years later, like another maybe two, three years later, and he he said, well, what are you doing with this? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, who's putting it out? I said, I don't know. He goes, I'll put it out. So this is like right at the very tail end of a CD in that scene of music mattering at all. Because I don't think the same exact story could even happen now. Right. So this that. is like 2006. So yeah, so the thing came out and uh, it got some good reviews. And I was already, me and Tom Blankart were already going over there. So it was sort of coinciding with our first trips to Europe just to play for people. And it kind of snowballed pretty fast from there. And again, what's shocking to me is just the lack of interest in New York in stuff that is basically very New York, which is like outlandish, unique. Yeah, that's always uh, been the case though. I'll just say I'll just say no way for convenience. Sure, yeah, yeah. Oh, jazz, mm-hmm. and that that and this is what I mean. This is what pisses me off. It's also why I left New York in 1990. To me, mm-hmm. it was over. But I see these incredible musicians all the time mm. playing for very small audiences. I'm like, why the fuck do you bother? But the reason I guess you bother is because it's better to play out to no one than to sit in your bedroom and play to yourself only. I yeah, you got to choose your battles. I mean, like I. But then, but then again, you go to Europe and you go to these festivals that are incredible. It's just it's such a dichotomy between. between I don't know. Here I mean, there. They, that, when Tim and I toured with Mike in the fall, we did under a big what, range. Under this, what? Under what guys? Was this that? was like a this was like a professionally booked like quote unquote jazz tour. And was that under your name? Pulverize the Pulverize. Sound. It was a collective band, sound. and we played. So uh, that was this fall under Pulverize the Sound. Yes. In Europe. Yeah. So like no, it was a about ten day tour, almost two weeks. We played every day. I think I, we had one day off in Poland. In or in Cologne, no, no, we Cologne. had a day off in Cologne. And so we had two days off, which is not good, but they were... No, but they were, they were actually... They were cool. worked out because we are, our, our train, the trains shut down. And oh, yeah, yeah. We, we so needed and and Pulverize the Sound consists of Peter Evans on trumpet, Tim Dole on bass. And Mike, Mike Ryan on drums. Yeah. Exactly. So we do this tour, and we we played a pretty big range of... We did, like, big jazz festivals and, like, small, tiny clubs. Which is what you have to do, but at least there's that variety. But the thing is, the small club gigs, just the music's, the music's better. I mean, these are, they're not, they're also packed. They're not like small club gigs to two people. I mean, I mean, the music is just better. Like the, the, the shit here. I mean, yes, we can, we can make it work at a big, on a big stage, but the, I forget who I read, talked about this, but like there's that, the movie, there's a movie from the eighties. That's like, it's really about Bud Powell, but Dexter Gordon, it's kind of about Dexter Gordon around midnight. And so there's this whole like, like vindication scene at the end where he's playing to some huge audience in a stadium and it's like, oh, he finally got his due, but it's like none of the best jazz is made in a fucking stadium. <laughs> it's so no. stupid. Well, you, know? <laughs> you know? Because you're, you're responding 
you, you know, you're not you're not dependent on on the sound engineer. You're responding about how the the sound is reflecting off the walls. Yeah. How the people are absorbing yeah. it, and you're and, and and of course the people are part of it at that yeah. point. And, it, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's a very intimate experience. Well, I mean, it's a very intimate experience, and that's why I think it should be experienced live. Yeah. And that's why I think New York is a fucking suck my dick off and get the <laughs> fuck away from me. Hey, I left. People, hey, hey, I left a long time ago. Because the thing is, is like. This is intimate music. This is music of the highest weird, uh, just tr- transmorphine. Yeah, yeah. Trans- this, is be- this is something that goes beyond. There's people who can decode the bloodline. Yeah. It's going forward and backward in history. Yeah. It wants to commit to an intimate experience, which you may or may not like, but you cannot be unaffected by. Mm-hmm. But people are so fucking lazy now because they can just sit at home and do their fucking Tinder whoring or just go online and watch anything they want. Yeah. But that is not a specifically how music that's highly individual needs to be experienced. Yeah. I mean, I love you too because I'm happy everybody can see whatever they want to see about anybody. <laughs> but the kind of shit we do is something that needs to be experienced live because until you have seen the way this man maneuvers his mouth <laughs> and the sounds that come out of it, you got no idea what I'm fucking talking about, kids. <laughs> Peter Evans, this is Lydia Lunch with the Lydian's Win and Tim Dahl. Let's take a minute off. <laughs> This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. We are speaking with Peter Evans tonight, master trumpet player, bizarre and unique individual, great brain, kind of hot too. Whoa, oh my God. It's getting gals, there. Oh my gals, God. Lo- gals, gals like that shit. They do. And uh, I don't know if that was uh, Peter's motivation, but maybe it is now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or joke. Maybe not. All right. So a lot of women are not attracted to this kind of music and this kind of music, which we cannot define because it is somewhere outside of out jazz or no wave. It's just emotionally intense, psychotic. It's, it's music that is the base the root of it is frustration, anger, love, passion. It's poisoned and it's clearing out the poison and it comes out in many different formats. But I try it whenever I bring women to these gigs, they love it. And then they want to start dancing, which I always want to dance to this show. And then people are like, I don't want to make a scene, but to me, it's very psychedelic. Well, I, 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 but I do yeah. think even if, even if people don't understand it, 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 in terms of its language and its history musically, in terms of just the sexuality of an arguably non-marketed sexual music, I think if you if you own it and you actually create your own, just in general, if you're an expressive person, you create your own freedom and you create your own reality and you actually can do that that's and you can actually sustain right. that. Okay, as a, that, that as, be, as a bass player, yeah. which is a very sensual instrument, whether you go psychotic on it or go sleazy or classical. Simple, yeah. Well, no, not the way Kim Dahl plays it. The bass is a very sensual instrument. I've seen many of these shows and you were saying like, you were talking about sexuality, but what is the turnoff for me is that a lot of it is what I consider white boy crack dick frustration. And hence, no wonder women are not attracted to it. Now, not all of it is that. But so much of this music and so much of my music and so much of all art anyway in general is based upon trying to get out this frustration or this desperation that if you do not, will boil your blood and you might hurt somebody. So you might as well just hurt a few people's ears and get it out of yourself. Not all of it is that, but a lot of it is based on this irritating frustration which lives with within all of us weirdo musicians. I'm yeah. not a musician, you are. Yeah, I think that, I, do you think it's a male thing? Yeah. Pretty much so. I mean, there's not that many women on the out on the out scene. As far as the sexual, I mean, is there something that is attractive about men pushing limits? Of course, but you know what? If they're just pushing limits to be an irritating cocksucker, no. I mean, if it's just about their own frustration, I, I don't know. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Trying what about to, filtering? Okay, so there's this, there's this book that came out a couple of years ago. It's all. It's every single interview that Coltrane ever did. It compiled into one book, even like shit that nobody cares about, like him, like in a hotel room in Japan. You can barely understand what he's saying because the tape's so bad. And there's this weird, some weird shit at the end. That Baroness woman, that like she had some aristocratic lady that um, was friends with Charlie Parker and Monk and all these people. She kind of took these people in right. in New York. Yes. So Coltrane knew her, and there's this letter that he wrote to her, not even before he died, just at some point in the 50s or 60s. And it's like, like dear Baroness, blah blah blah. I have three wishes that I, that I would like to come true in my life. And one of them was, I wish I had three times my current sexual power. 
And it's like, that's not something we, that's not the kind of attitude we associate with someone like Coltrane, but actually it makes sense. This guy is like, basically just like, <laughs> you well, know? I mean, also look, between even Ornette Coleman, Albert Eiler, Miles Davis at his most perverse, and what now exists in this kind of music that was influenced by it. I mean, there was still something people, especially women could grasp onto. And I think the, the, the issue is this, men, they are, you, they, they, it's normal for men who are frustrated or who are angry or who are just have too much energy, too much testosterone to find a way to put it out there in an extreme way, whether it's through brutality, whether it's through violence, whether it's through violent music, violent films, vi- uh, motorsports, whatever. And I think women are used to turning it inward, and that's the problem. So I think that's why there's a lack. But I don't think it's the same way in Europe. I think that in Europe, because... Uh, People understand both uh, sexuality, death, the connection, uh, culture, violence. You think it's a more sophisticated way of interpreting this? Yes. Can I challenge you both on this one? You and and I, I could be way off with this, but uh, how about this? It's harder to make a living as a musician than ever, and it's not the most attractive thing of fucking. So don't do it, kids. Struggling <laughs> fucking loser, fucking Dude. not making a cent. And you know what? So that, and then the thing is. When people play this extremely incredible music that nobody has ever heard before, of course they're going to be bound to be poor. So this way I always tell people, do not go into music, be smart, become a doctor, make new drugs, <laughs> well, doctors, develop architecture, I'm you'll, be in, this one too. you'll be in debt forever. I'm gonna challenge you. Musicians were the first to endure the extreme uh, tech wave of uh, you know obsolete uh, existence in terms of- We were of, like a test case. Uh, well, not Maybe the first, books. But, one, yeah. but one of them, yeah. one of them. And as we all know, and as all the articles are right, you know, doctors, you know, I'm, I'm curious when the people are gonna be on the fucking street okay, this, with this, the tech revolution. Just to, go back, just to go back a couple steps related to this, I kind of like, in uh, September, I did my first trip to Japan. And so this guy, Koichi Makagami, who Tim's played with from Hukashu, he set up, basically set up my whole tour with, with this other guy, Kevin, um, a piano player that I know. And, and Japan, I mean, which not only like, has complete respect for all kinds of music, but they, like they extreme consume, music. They, they love jazz. They also, they, the, the average, jazz, the, the, jazz, the average Japanese noise. citizen consumes three times through money, yeah. consumes three times the amount of music than the average American. So, uh, so one of the, 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 probably the best thing that happened the whole t- tour because I basically said yes to everything I was like whatever you want whatever you throw at me Makigami I'll do so I played almost every day and there was one thing I really wanted to do which came through and it was with this guy uh, Ko Ishikawa who plays in like uh, he plays in one of the last remaining Gugaku orchestras this is like the royal court music and he plays a show which is the mouth organ it's like a chromatic bamboo mouth organ and so I, I met him, I played with him a couple times. So he plays in this really hyper traditional music, which is, by the way, so fucking insane. It's one of the weirdest kinds of music ever. And he recommended a, a young Koto player who's kind of getting her feet wet with improvising, uh, named Kosetsu Imanishi, to play with us. So we did three or four concerts, trio. And there sh- it's, not, um, it's not flashy, it's like very slow and spacious and. Um, very unlike a lot of the music that I, it's very glacial the way it works. So we did, we played a gig at a temple that's, yeah, we did all this shit, but the music, it's still, the qualities that you're talking about, it still had all that stuff. Exactly. So, and it wasn't, it wasn't like sexy in that same way, but, but it still had it. The intensity is it was what super makes in, it. It's super intense. And the intensity I mean, is what intense. makes it attractive. Yeah. So. I loved it. Yeah, so I want to go back to. I want to talk about freedom again, and just your, for the, my brother. Well, no, and and, and yes. well, because I, I, I've, no, I've known lovers. I've known Peter for, for a little while now, and I and uh, and this is not just lip service. I mean, I think one thing that Peter, besides uh, his dedication to the the craft of the trumpet and the and the art of music, is basically his insistence on having human standards, um, and 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 not fucking putting himself. In a gutter, and 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 no, well, you you you, you want to talk about people fucking being here, and the, and they're playing for no one, and they they're going nowhere, quote unquote. I mean, they're going somewhere, but they, they're also not treating. I didn't them, say they were going nowhere. Not, no, 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 but they're not treating themselves as well as they should treat themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, how and, do they and, figure and, out how to do that? Well, we figure out, but but by having standards. So as Peter was touching earlier, we play the big festivals, but the experience of playing the small room is still important. And even with, even with his agency, which is a top agency, I don't have to mention them. He he says, well, you know, I don't want two days off. Even if you're getting me these big shows, I want to play. Go to small and, and, some and, small and, town and, and play. And don't, don't 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 be an obstructionist. I want to play in this specific room. And, and guess what? 
the people that love it are going to show up, and that's important to me. And buy merch, because, and because, exactly. Because yeah. yeah. I want that experience. I'm not just doing here, doing this here, to be flown right, around exactly. to have yeah. this fake experience of what actually what the real deal is. Not, mm. not even that, that it would be necessarily a fake experience. No, no, right. But I mean, they, they look. I, I prefer to perform for 50 people. Yeah, I often pretty perform ideal. for more. Yeah, but I, I mean, I have a salon mentality. Mm. That's what I consider myself. I have a salon mentality. You know, my basic format is spoken word, even when there's music with it. And I think I want to look into everybody's eyes specifically, because what I do is a very intimate thing. But that's why we have to be jugglers. This is why I have to juggle. I have to be a geographical juggler. Like, what can I put here to support that there? And that's the most difficult thing of what I do is like, what can I put in this country that makes the money to support that in this country? That might be something totally different. So, so I want to make a thread about the two of you, because I've worked with both of you. And you both have this ability, and, and again, this is not a compliment, but it's interesting about the two of you and, and how, you're, uh, how you guys evolve. The two of you both know when to move on, and you're not afraid, and you're both, you're both, uh, you're both okay, this hit a limit. Let's, no, it's, yeah, it's, just, abso- it's absolutely true. And, just, and, and, and that's, no, that scares yeah. people because yeah. you, you get into a nice groove and it's working, well, and, and Miles right, Davis is about address, that too. It's like, wanna, how do you move on to the I next I want to address thing? that, or I want to address that. Look, when I first began creating stuff, because I don't even want to call it music, when I first started creating music that would um, support my spoken word, which was just really the machine gun to the bullets I was firing, I started with this. I had a concept. Then I'd find the collaborators. And usually once I recorded, and I don't even know, mainly I had to find the money to pay for most of my early recordings myself. So once I recorded it, I would tour it or not, often not. So I had a concept. I wanted to execute it. I did document it, and then I would move on. And then sometimes it's two or three bands at the same time. And this is how I always thought. It was only in the last few years when working with Retrovirus or Big Sexy Noise, these are the only two projects that I've ever done more than one record with. I mean, Big Sexy Noise, I was with for five years, and I'm going back to working with them. Retrovirus, six years. It's not over yet. And the reason why Retrovirus carries on is because so much of my music has not been heard live. And with, with Weasel Walter and Tim Dahl, there's, uh, they bring another element, they bring another uh, excitement to it, which has a connective tissue that may or may not have existed through the musical schizophrenia of what I do. So and with Big Sexy Noise, just cock rock, and I like to do it. I mean, let's face it, I mean, I like to Sharp cock turns, rock. Oh, well, no, no, no. So it, it's a fine dance. And, it, it, you, you know, of course, Lydia always talks about, you know, because you work with Nick Cave, uh, barely, uh, barely, but but she's known. Rolling this she, out because 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 there's it's like grass green on the other side of the fence. I mean, Lydia also says, "Well, that you know, you do the same thing over and over." Yeah, she's, you do the same she, fucking she album for twenty the years. The most successful people she's known are doing the same thing forever. Well, and they had and they, but, they, they did it. But then, our, Sonic what, what, what's, what, you what's, play the same album success? for twenty years. Artist- you go on the same tour. You drive it into people's heads. People are just catching up to what I did in fucking seventy seven. Right. Yeah, I can't. Long catch then, you have, up. Then, you have, then you have Miles Davis, and, and it's it's that dance. And and well, and there's not one answer is what I'm getting at. I mean, I, I mean, ACDC played the same fucking shit forever, and then and then, and then you have rock bands that were ever evolving, and they made that work. How do you make it work? But both of you, I mean, I guess it's also the rate of you know, if you tour something all the time, you move on. Then you have other things that come back a, a year or two well, later. The only way I've been able to support my uh, habitual musical schizophrenia is by is by being able to be mobile and move. Like uh, live in a live in a cheap city for four years, go to an expensive one for two years. Well, go to a cheap city for four years, go to an expensive one for two years, and just figure out how to do that. It's not. I've been homeless many times in my adult life. I was homeless for four years until two years ago. I'm homeless again. <laughs> and it's the price of being a fucking artist. Kids don't do it. <laughs> well, this so, is the Lydian <laughs> spin with Lydia Lunch Tim Dahl. Our Ooh. guest is Peter Evans. So Peter Evans, I'm kind of going there. Here he lives in Lisbon I'm just, I'm now. I'm just taking this in. I, I, I'm, I'm taking I'm this in. Here. No, because because. So, so basically, you had a great run with mostly other people do the killing. Sure. And and, and what got, was mostly other people do? Great was, title. Mostly other people do the killing. Go ahead. Tell. Can you tell us what that was, Peter? It was a band started by a bass player named Mappa Elliott. Uh, I met him in college. He moved to New York about a year or two ahead of me. And when I moved here, he was like one of the only people I knew. And he started this band with uh, Kevin Shea and John Arabagon, and we played tiny venues in New York for a few years, and then. Once individual members started going over to Europe, we kind of got the whole band over. It and kind of took off. It, it took off. It, in it, Europe. It took off and definitely only in Europe. Yeah. Yes. yes. 
And you guys were in magazines, and and you guys, mm -hmm. were, and then you were touring. We were like regularly. Yeah, we. What was we, the theme of the music of that? Well, that's the problem. Is that the theme for me was something that was it was very different, even maybe even among the members of the band, but especially the perception and the marketing of the band was this like jokey, ironic kind of thing, which I didn't really relate to that aspect of it. The th aspect I related to was the kind of collage. Like the idea that you could have like four, four Just pieces, four pieces happening at the same time. Right. That you, that the you arrangements, could be, arrangements, the it, it was super, in, yeah, super interactive. It was that, that was the band where I developed like this kind of sixth sense thing of like you can hear something coming from ten minutes away and anticipate it, and all of a sudden the band, even though we've been doing some noise for for ten minutes, all of a sudden is locked into something, and no, the audience has no idea how that happened. That's where I learned that skill of that band, and that was the most important thing and you about cut, it. You cut a lot of t your, it's road yeah. chops on that. All that stuff, yeah, touring, waking up early, like but playing be, every day, all that shit. But the idiot, idiomatic part of it is the idiom of the the actual idiom of the music. Like I, I never really thought it was like a joke. I mean, the idea that like uh, I can go from playing like Roy Eldridge to playing some like wall of noise is something that I kind of take pride that I can do those things. And I, I like connecting them. For me, they're connected. But the audience, like there was a moment on stage where I, I remember specifically making some certain noise on the microphone and seeing some like Belgian, you know, guy that has no other reason to leave his house, you know, to put like, to put, like I saw him just kind of crack up in some sort of automated response, and I just wanted a fake take. You know those like um, the meat cleavers with the the little point. I want to just go down and fucking pound his face. Even I was like, like "You're fucking those, laughing at this thing." Though, he might have been the one that actually got it. He got it in a way. I actually, I'm open to he people having different responses. People have different responses to music, whatever. But the idea that I started to think like this guy has been basically programmed to think that he's supposed to laugh at this juxtaposition of sounds. Wait, how can he been programmed to laugh at that? Because it's a mark. Because the band was sold like that. that way. The band is sold as this like funny thing, and I really didn't like that. It really got to me. Can you That's, imagine how I feel about how I've never been marketed, but people like to paint their fear on my fucking face? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I don't give a shit <laughs> so about so this interpretation. What, what I'm getting at is that was that, and you know, in this world where it's hard to make hard, hard to make the money. Are we trying to wrap this up? Yeah, we, 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 uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm getting. I mean, there's a lot of hand signals no, 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 no. here. No, it's Italian no, shit. No, I don't know. In this world <laughs> where it's hard to make money, Peter made the bold choice to leave that band who has who had a steady. Top, well, wait top. a minute though, because the thing is that. There's a there's only so many gigs and I I play a frontline instrument whether or not I was a side man in that band because I am standing literally it's so stupid as this because I'm standing in the front of the band with a trumpet if I'm going on tour with one band I'm still dealing with this now you go on tour with a band where you're not the quote unquote leader and then you want to do your own thing two months later and you want there's only so many clubs right, that can yes, pay well yeah, 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 they're yeah, like yeah. hey man you were already here two months ago so you're kind of competing I, with I yourself know, I, yes I know that yeah I so I'm I, I basically saw that that was that was coming to a head and wanted to get out but it's better for you in, in your instance before I made enemies be, with the guys in the band yeah, you know? right to be the leader of whatever you wanted to do even if it was only you I like collaborative yourself. shit but yeah there's that too yeah, right, yeah. I mean Look, I have to do a lot of solo shit. I have a lot of collaborations. Yeah. I can't just do one thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but first of all, I don't want to just do one thing. Right. Second of all, I couldn't support myself by just doing one. Right. Yeah, some, you know. sometimes a lot I get of time the spoken word is supported the music. Mm. Well, we need to. We need uh, musicians. Got to be malleable. Need to make a living. You got to be. And, yeah. And and, and and guess what? Most don't. Uh, guess what? Most, most, don't, most people don't have. Don't all. try that at. Okay, try it at home. Keep it in your fucking garage. Don't think you're going to take it on the road and be successful. Sometimes, sometimes when I'm I do here the, to discourage <laughs> you from going into music. You know what? I don't really no. worry. I don't really, yeah. I mean, sometimes like people ask like when I do this teaching shit, like, well, how do you, uh, how how have you managed to just have this career where you just do the shit that you want? And it's like, well, actually, the shit that I want is pretty malleable. Like my desires in music change, and they're adaptable. I'm not gonna say I'm a complete slut, but like, well, I, not, can not change, music, I can change. I can like, I can move around. You not know, with your like, music at least. And what? Not with your music, at least. Well, no, but I mean, within what I do, like, yeah, I can play. My goal in life is to be able to show up anywhere and play with fucking anybody and like make it work. If they're open. No, okay, speaking of that, you know, who would you want to show up and play with? That's James do Brown. Have list? Then. Mm. Do you have a list? Do you have a list? Because I don't have a list. I don't want to play with anybody unless the concept suits it. But Particular people? Yeah, who's your bucket list of musicians? Nice. Mm. Any? Maybe you don't. Are they all dead? No, Maybe no, you've no. already played with them all. No, no, no. I mean, like, okay, so, so like the trio with uh, with the um, the trio that I played with in Japan that was on my list for a couple years. Like that, that was so. I and I did it. I'll now. probably do it again. Um, Bucket forward. 
I don't know if I have a bucket list. I don't really think See, of it I like that. I understand that because I don't, uh, there's nobody I can sit here well, and think I, I want to work with anybody. I think it's Peter more of a general with goal. To play with. You know? I think Peter plays with whoever he wants to play with. But it's more about finding people that are, if they're open and I'm open, then we can show up and play, make some music. I would say that I've had very, very few unpleasant experiences because, again, the concept came first and then the people were chosen for that. And also the way that I like to work, and you know it very well from working with me, is I do consider creation a sacred space where no bullshit could, should come in. Of course, sometimes it does. Then we get rid of it. Where, I mean, Yeah, that's, that's, I soured need, my, that's the only relationship that are soured are like I that. I don't need my ego fed, but I do pump up other people because, I mean, because I want them to know how great they are. I don't need them to say anything, but however, some people you just can't pump up. But the point is this. Creation should be a sacred space where no bullshit is con- contaminates. I've had very few bad experiences after 40 years of working with people, but I guess I just know how to choose. I did this concert a couple of years ago at this gallery in uh, the East Side where they wanted uh, the, Go- the Levy Gorvey Gallery, and they had a William de Kooning and Jiao Wuqi double exhibit. And those two guys were tight with musicians and like Mingus and blah, blah, blah. And so the, there's a guy that works there. Who, he's the guy that installs the art, and he's a mu- musician. And so he basically convinced them to, to put on a concert. And the concert was supposed to feature the music by Varez and Charlie Parker because there's like this connection. So he was like, can you find some people that can deal with both of these languages? And so one, one of the people that I, that I thought of immediately was the guy Warren Smith. Do you guys know Warren Smith? No. He's like probably 80 percussionist right, of course so why would i know him but classical percussionist right. well this is the thing so he's a class he classical percussionist who uh was a black classical musician in new york and couldn't do certain the, the, the or symphonies that wasn't like part of the thing oh interesting. So he's like well that's no problem i'll play in all the broadway shows all the studio shit this guy did fucking everything right. then he played all the, the free jazz shit he played like straight ahead stuff he did everything he was janice joplin's music director he played on like sesame street i mean all kinds of stuff he played in tony Williams' lifetime as like the secondary percussionist. Oh, okay. So we were hanging backstage, and he, and he he said something about playing, and I was I was not trying to get anecdotes out of him. I was like, hey, Warren, man, I watched this video of you with Tony Williams, and he was like, he said something awesome, which was, if you're around somebody that's doing something impossible every day, you start to just think it's normal, and then you start to expect that of yourself. Great. And Fantastic. so it's like I'm around people doing impossible shit like kind of daily. And it's just become normal. Like I used to do a gig with Craig Tabor, and it's like he's making sine, microtonal sine, sine waves come out of the piano, like with no preparations or electronics or anything. It's like what the fuck is going? And then you ask him about it. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm kind of kind of working on that. No, no big deal. But you know, he's like he knows what he's doing. So I mean, I'm around people that are doing pretty much impossible things all the time, and I always, even from listening to shit like on records, like Coltrane. I mean, I always thought that was kind of what you're supposed to do: find some insane shit and do it. Like, I don't know, I, I remember... Well, because I, the insane shit from insane people, it actually keeps people sane. When you <laughs> have the possibility of becoming insane because of your bloodline, your history, your I think we're normal. I think we're actually we're some of the only normal people well, around. I think we're extremely... Well, I wouldn't say normal, but I would say extremely um, sane. Yeah. Normal? I'm not sure, but sane. Sane, okay. Because, because we know, we know that we have to find a method to release the insanity that is in our bloodline and is in our DNA and is a decoding that we have done through music, through art, through literature. Because if we didn't do that, we would be even more violent or self-destructive or um, brutal than we are. Well, as a band member put it, he said, if, you know, he said if we weren't playing this music, we'd either be working at CVS or be serial well, killers. Just, what's, what's the fucking, what's the purpose of the artist? And, and, and this might sound arrogant, it might, it might sound self-centered, but it's, 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 A, it's giving, and it's also to help society how to see, how to hear, because it's all abstraction anyways. And, and, and basically, if you have a different perspective that helps motivate and guide humanity, and you have that gift, you got to share it at that Art is the self to the universal wound. I mean, this is what it is. This is what it's supposed to be. This is what it lives to be. Because from our own wounds or from our own frustration or from our own insanity or from our own boiling of the blood that goes beyond our fucking lifetime comes something that has to come out. And sometimes it's poetic and beautiful and sometimes it's atrocious and still yet beautiful because the hideous cannot be avoided because we are often fucking hideous. And sometimes from the hideousness of life itself, the hideousness of history, at least in my mind's eye, I have to find some beauty in the horror that has come before me and the horror that has made me who the fuck I am. This is Lydia Lunch. You're listening to Lydia Spin with Tim Dahl and Peter Evans. Peter, 
Mr. Evans, how can people contact you or where can they find your stuff? I run a label. I'm a terrible CEO, but I do it, and I have a lot of records out. More is more records. It's on Bandcamp. Buy my shit. It's awesome. More is more records. Yep. Say that A lot of good records. More is more records. Other than that, I live in sunny Portugal. And uh, well, that's a recent thing, and I, I don't blame thing. you because but you're touring around the world. Tour around the world. So look, go to my website. I'm playing in a town near you, or your town. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it could be anywhere. Actually. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. Actually, if anybody would like to book Peter Evans, all they have to do is look him up, and I'm sure he'd love I'm to come I'm super easy to find. Time. I even have an Instagram oh, yeah. account now. He's got he's got large ensembles, and on he's Instagram? got so, he's got a solo act. He's actually. Everything from solo to full orchestra, whatever you need. Yeah, exactly. I did a fashion show for Kanye yeah, West. I'm so just bummed that we didn't what? get. We, I didn't, I'm bummed that you, we didn't get to your wait, inside. Wait, 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 back, back, wait, wait, oh, wait. Yeah. Back. Inside There's what? There's so much stuff. Hang on. There's so much you shit. You did. did a fashion show for Kanye yeah, West. Um, I hope you were well paid. I thought I was, Please but now don't. that I look back, back on it, I don't know. It wasn't that long ago. Can you tell the Kanye West story real quickly? Yeah, sure. So, because I mean, all of the people that listen to this want to fucking and, and, get rid and of that. I want to hear all the classical stories. We don't have enough time. Yeah, yeah. So. Did a, uh, I was, yes, sitting around, get an email from some guy who was a fan, young, young guy who said, I work for this person who needs a trumpet player uh, for this event, like super vague. And so it ended up being Vanessa Beecroft, who's like a performance artist. And uh, I looked into her and I was like, all right, so what, <laughs> what is this thing? And uh, turns out she was doing, she was basically choreographing Kanye West's new Adidas fashion show unveiling thing like in two, I think it was 2015 or 16. It was the reason I couldn't come to your Super Bowl party that year was because I had to leave for a tour that ended the day that this gig happened. Okay. I remember that very well. So, all right, cool. so basically I said, yeah, sure. I'll do it. Um, they said, we only need you for like 10 minutes. So I was like, all right, I want, I think I asked for a thousand bucks, which seemed very, you know, it seemed good at the time. But really, but you it really, it seemed good at the time. Should have added a zero. A couple, zero. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the models got paid less than me, but well, still, I felt they, underpaid. They, they sucked dick and didn't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looked like a it looked like an anorexic version of Dune. I mean, it was insane. <laughs> this you should watch a video of this thing. Was, what happened? I mean, do you really not like the way that models walk like gazelles? I mean, don't you like the way they, they weren't? Walk? Check out what they did. Hey, this, well, is, this is a different conversation. The I'm way they tell walk. The story, tell the story. The way they walk actually is related to this. So about what happened? So basically, I say, yeah, sure, I'll do it, a thousand bucks, and so then I go on this tour a solo tour at a rental car in Canada in February. And so, of course, I got snowed in on my way back. Everything went great except for that. So I'm not going to – I was going to come back the day of, of this um, this thing, like at some warehouse in Chelsea. And so they called me frantically the night before. They said, can you can you come tonight and, and do like a run-through? And I was like, no, I can't come. I'm, I'm in the snow. By and the they, way, what, did, what, what were they asking you to play? They, yeah. they wanted me to play a tune by Nina Roti, who wrote these like kind of fake Italian – Fo you know, he would adapt these tunes like the Godfather theme, whatever. So, so they were like, "Can you come tonight?" I said, "I can't come." And then they said, "This is language that no musician would ever use. Can you send a stand-in?" I was like, "A stand what? A stand-in? When you, you really don't give a fuck what I play. You just want a body, a warm body to stand Pre there, to literally play stand. Play your record unless somebody pretends to play you." So I, I, I had a, a a younger trumpet player that I knew and said, "I'll give you a hundred bucks just to go to this place nice. and stand around and let me know what happened. Tell me everything." It's and so, yeah. and so <laughs> he does, and he writes me. He's like, "They don't care about the Nina Roti shit. They want you to play ten long notes for a minute each with pauses. And I was like, what? Actually, I was like, I'm kind of good at that. And so, that's and my so, speciality. So that's my speciality. So I show up the next day and it's like, you know, French guys in tight t-shirts and chains around their neck. They're like, come with us and blah, blah, blah. They're whisking me away. And, and they, uh, Put a pair of shoes on me and sent me to this thing, and it's all they, these. Wait, wait, wait! Why did they put shoes on you? They put these Adidas these, shoes these on me. Special Kanye West Which design. Which you never wear any Actually, other time in your life. Actually, they were quite comfortable. I would have taken them. So. Oh, they're too cheap to give you a fucking pair. They were too cheap to give me a pair. Yeah. Um, $5,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, $5,000 really, Adidas. Oh, yeah, yeah, you Five, know what? Which costs like 50 cents to make. And the bitches won't even give you a fucking bear. And you're supposed to hold a note for but a I minute. But I trolled them, off. which is, I trolled them. I trolled them by playing the, you know, the opening of uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. I do not, but carry on. I played the theme in 10 times slow motion <laughs> with one note per minute. Nice. <laughs> so if you sped it up, it was like, bum, 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 the thing as a way to entertain myself. But there was all the Kardashians and Beyonce and Justin Bieber. Uh, Peter, can I give you one word of advice? Next time those motherfucking bloodsuckers come around. Add zeros, add whatever, yeah. You know what? Call me and I'll be your agent. Because you know what? These people make money from doing nothing. 
but being fucking media superstars. I mean, if there's anything worse than the words you just said, which are basically the Kardashians and Kanye West, yeah. I've yet to really find out what that is. I mean, <laughs> Kardashian, these are just, they've been getting- They're scum. Can I say this? Yeah. They have been getting black men off for decades. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. And Kanye West, if there is a less talented fucking musician out there who has been, I don't even know where his brain damage comes from. I'd like to find that out. <laughs> but however, with all that fucking money, I really don't know what they're doing to get that. It just proves my point. How dumb do you have to fucking be? All right, so here, here, How <laughs> dumb do you have to fucking be? You're pretty fucking stupid. That's here, here, all. Here's a little celebrity. Ah, I'm going to go vomit. Celebrity gossip <laughs> question. With, with all these people that have these publicists that make sure they're in the magazines yep. every fucking week. Yep. Just from a plain, just primal point, did anyone in that crowd of Kardashians and Beyonce stand out like, holy shit, that person actually looks like something? You know who looked great? Not the people that were there, like the in, the people invited, the people that were working there. It was almost like, man, like- Oh, they're sucking the, up so much. The women that are like, that are like making sure that you're sitting in the right seat were like, it's so beautiful. Well, you man. know the beautiful insane. thing about them? They would the have no fucking interest in any actual- The Kardashians look- Real person, because really, unless you have the fucking bling bling, what are they going to be fucking the interested in The Kardashians look pretty bad up, I mean, up close. Really, really? bad. Well, yeah, really? Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, went to grad school with said that- uh, Kim, Kim looks okay. Look she looks okay. Kim looks okay. Yes, I can understand Kim. No matter Kim. how hot she looks- Beyonce you, doesn't look so good up close. No matter how hot she looks to you, you don't look fucking hot to her. <laughs> This is the Lydian stream with Lydia Lunch and Tim Doll. We're talking to Peter Evans. Ooh. Yeah, and the Kardashians can kiss my fucking ass. I can't believe we're talking about them. Well, you, you brought it up. 